All right, here's our chance to talk about an extremely common problem that you see certainly every week in your practice. I'm pleased to talk to you about asthma and I don't have any conflicts of interest to share. We're gonna talk about diagnosis, assessment, treatment, and then I hope to touch upon some special aspects at the end. And if we could, let's start with a case. A 27-year-old woman, mother of two young children, finds that every time she gets a cold, it settles in her chest with paroxysms of cough, a wheezy sounding cough, the cough that lingers, it seems, for weeks. She reports a history of eczema as a child and mild symptoms of seasonal allergic rhinitis. She's atopic. You're considering asthma, but maybe it's a post-bronchitic cough. Maybe she just gets lingering cough after a cold uh, and is exposed to those young children. How will we decide? Is this truly asthma? Before we commit her to years of therapy for a diagnosis of asthma. And... Um, uh, sorry, uh, we're going to take a history and we're going to look for those characteristic symptoms, the tightness, the wheezing, cough, uh, uh, shortness of breath, they come and go. They're not chronic. They're not there every day. Uh, and look for characteristic triggers. The person who tells us, oh, I have those symptoms when I'm around the pet cat. That's probably asthma, cold air, exercise, as opposed to some nonspecific triggers, the hot, humid day, the irritant smoke, et cetera. And we'll look for a characteristic response to medications. I think the patient who comes and says that the albuterol inhaler that I tried didn't help and that course of prednisone didn't do anything for me, that's probably not asthma because those are very effective for asthma. We'll listen to the lungs. If there's diffuse wheezing in a characteristic way, we'll say that's asthma as opposed to low-pitched wheezes, cough, clear out those ronchi, that's mucus hypersecretion, as opposed to that focal monophonic, <laughs> that's a narrow, you know, focal bronchial narrowing. And as opposed to the one that fools all of us periodically, the upper airway wheeze, the <laughs> It sounds very much like it might be asthma, but it's coming from here and hard to hear over the lower thorax. And maybe the patient has a clear chest when you see them. How are we gonna uh, be clear about the diagnosis? And still in 2020, it, where diagnosis is based on variable airflow obstruction, documenting that there is narrowing of the airways that reverses because we can uh, uh, modify airway smooth muscle constriction, which is a big part of asthma. So it varies over time. We were able to make multiple measurements of lung function and found that the airflow obstruction changed. We administered a bronchodilator and saw that within 10 minutes, there was a significant improvement in airflow. Or if necessary, sometimes we do a provocative stimulation in someone with normal lung function. Can we bring out airflow obstruction, and we'll touch upon the role of measurement of exhaled nitric oxide, a novel biomarker. So we said, is there a significant response to bronchodilator? And this is probably worth remembering. Significant is defined as a 12% increase in FEV1 and an absolute increase in FEV1 of 200 milliliters. Less than this might be the effect of the medicine, might be variation from the testing. Uh, and then what's asthmatic? There's no absolute cutoff. The bigger the response, the more characteristic of it, it being asthma, 15% in some studies, 20% people use in others. Now that methacholine challenge, just to take a quick look, would be done in someone with normal lung function, but you're still suspecting maybe that's asthma. Uh, here are four different subjects brought to the lab given increasing doses of methacholine, that's each dot. And here in orange was someone with a normal response, meaning there was no change in FEV1 or less than eight, a 20% fall. It remained greater than 80% of normal. And here were three persons with hyper-responsiveness, probably asthma, and they differ in their um, uh, sensitivity to the provocative stimulus. And that's shown here by extrapolating to the point of the dose of methacholine causing a 20% fall in the FEV1 crossing this line. 
a small dose of methacholine, the PC20 was low, provocative concentration of that methacholine causing a 20% fall. They were had a great deal of bronchial hyperresponsiveness. This person took a much larger dose of methacholine. They had a high PC20 and had relatively mild bronchial hyperresponsiveness. And part of what we're trying to do with anti-inflammatory therapy is shift this curve to the right, make our patients less hyper-responsive to a whole host of stimuli. Now, uh, this exhaled nitric oxide is intriguing. It's probably mostly done in specialist offices, but it's real-time measurement in exhaled breath of your patient's nitric oxide concentration in parts per billion in their exhaled breath. And it's a marker of eosinophilic inflammation. So not just how wide open or narrow are the breathing tubes, but is there a component of eosinophilic inflammation? Uh, a positive test is highly suggestive of asthma. And then patients already on inhaled steroids, the inhaled steroids by suppressing eosinophilic inflammation will reduce the exhaled nitric oxide level. If the uh, level is still high, One's wondering maybe this patient isn't taking their medicines or they have a refractory eosinophilic inflammation. And as we go on, we'll talk about biologic therapies that might be appropriate to address those resistant uh, patients. And I've emphasized the importance of making measurements of lung function, documenting reversible airflow obstruction, the diagnosis of asthma, in part because of evidence such as this, a study uh, of uh, more than 400 patients who had been diagnosed by their primary physician with having asthma. And this uh, Canadian team of pulmonologists, this SWAT team, went into the, uh, uh, found the patients, did extensive testing, review of medical records, adjusting the medicine, stopping them if possible. And what they found was that in a full third of patients, the diagnosis of asthma was uh, incorrect. They had something else. They had lingering cough, post-bronchitic cough, maybe uh, gastric reflux, et cetera. And what was important, I thought, was that more than half of these misdiagnoses were uh, associated with patients who had never had measurements of lung function. It was a presumptive diagnosis, and that's a big impact on their uh, lives, their medications, et cetera. So worth being clear about the diagnosis. Now, in assessing severity, uh, you know this, that we've been taught uh, to distinguish intermittent and persistent disease and persistent, mild, moderate, and severe based on frequency of daytime symptoms, frequency of nighttime awakenings with asthma, and measurements of lung function. And this is effective for patients not on regular medicines. But how do we compare someone already on one or two or three drugs in terms of this? And so there's been a shift, as you may know. Instead of thinking of a severity of disease, let's ask about asthma control. Is this asthma well controlled or not? We can do this on at each visit in any patient, regardless of the medications that they're taking. And what's our goal of well-controlled asthma? It was borrowed from this uh, staging system and said intermittent disease, uh, no more than two days out of the week with respiratory symptoms of asthma, no more than two nights out of the month waking with asthmatic symptoms, and lung function preserved within 80% uh, of the normal or baseline lung function. That would be good control. And the experts thinking about this said, and there's one other thing, and let's have two domains. One we just talked about, symptoms, exercise limitation, and measurement of lung function. But also think about risk of exacerbation, similar to what we heard Dr. Hirsch talk about in COPD. And they said one exacerbation in the last year, well, that happens. But two or more, that would be poorly controlled asthma. Let's step up therapy in order to achieve good control. Uh, and before we leave this topic of assessment, let's ask ourselves, assessing patients whose asthma isn't well controlled, what's driving it? What's preventing good uh, control? Before we escalate medicines, is there, are there inciting agents, the allergens, the pet cat in the bedroom, the cigarette smoking, the living in a high polluted area? 
Are there aggravating conditions that we need to address? The constant uh, air, upper airway inflammation of rhinosinusitis, the, the impact of reflux, perhaps to the level of the pharynx and larynx with aspiration of uh, gastric content. Is the patient really taking the medicines that we've prescribed? And are they doing it properly? Are they inhaling it well? Do we need to add a spacer device to help with their uh, compliance? Are there financial things and others getting in the way of good medication compliance? And finally, in this patient who may not be doing well on an effective therapy regimen that you've prescribed, are we sure about the diagnosis? Could it be something mimicking asthma like vocal cord dysfunction, that upper airway wheeze that I demonstrated, tracheomalacia, bronchiectasis, things that might not respond to typical asthmatic therapy? Well, that does bring us to treatment and our options. And we've, uh, as you know, uh, in talking to patients and thinking about therapies, talk about maintenance therapy controllers meant to prevent exacerbations and control good function. And the quick reliever, that quick acting beta agonist, use it if you need it, don't use it if you don't need it. And we'll go through these different controller medicines available. And uh, now for the last 13 years or so, we've had these guidelines from the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program that suggested a step care approach to escalating the therapies that we have. Everybody gets a short acting beta agonist to use as needed. Those who have more persistent disease should be begun on an inhaled corticosteroid or maybe, although overall less effective, a leukotriene modifier. For step three, the experts had some difficulty deciding we could add a long-acting beta agonist together with a low dose of inhaled steroid, or perhaps we should simply increase the dose of inhaled steroids. And they were wary at the time about adverse effects of these long-acting beta agonists and we'll come back to that. More difficult disease, let's use this uh, inhaled steroid at a medium dose together with a lava, high dose inhaled steroid together with a lava, and there now we're gonna consider biologic therapy. Finally, would be patients who are dependent on oral steroids. So the short acting beta agonists, you know, we have albuterol or leave albuterol, I think they are equivalent although the levalbuterol had hoped to have fewer adverse side effects, they're probably equivalent. And albuterol, I should mention, is available in a dry powder inhaler delivery system. They call it the respite. I did want to touch upon what's new and kind of interesting, exciting in the world of asthma. This is a not FDA-approved approach, but something recommended by the Global Initiative for Asthma, GINA, in their 2019 guidelines saying, you know, that a combination inhaled steroid that uses the long acting beta agonist for motorol, for motorol has a quick onset of action, as quick as albuterol. Could you use this for quick relief? And every time you use it, you get a little bit of inhaled steroid. The more you need it, the more inhaled steroid. Would it be appropriate for people with intermittent asthma instead of albuterol, so they get some anti-inflammatory steroid. And for, instead, uh, for mild persistent asthma, maybe they don't need daily inhaled corticosteroids. So this was a provocative approach, but it's been studied now a number of times. Here's 600 or more patients, intermittent and mild asthma, a one-year study. Some got albuterol as needed. Some uh, got this combination for motorol budesonide as needed for rescue uh, in response to symptoms. And then some were prescribed daily inhaled corticosteroids with an albuterol inhaler as needed, step two therapy. And the results here displayed in terms of exacerbation rate, here's this combination using the combination inhaled steroid, long acting beta agonist with a quick onset of action as needed based on symptoms, the exacerbation rate was suppressed just like those given daily inhaled steroids. In fact, the severe exacerbation rate looked the best for this combination approach. So it's something that many parts of the world are adapting. It's not FDA approved, but it may be something that we'll see coming down the line. If we choose an inhaled steroids, there are many to choose from. I thought I'd list them here. They come in different 
strength so we can start at a low dose and increase the strength, their meter dose inhalers, their dry powder inhalers, and more or less, they have the same benefit and risk profile, I would say. And then we mentioned that the group was uh, of experts were uncertain as to the next step. Should we uh, add a long-acting beta agonist to our low dose of inhaled steroid for maintenance therapy, or should we give a higher dose of inhaled steroids to better suppress inflammation? And the, the benefit, the who did best, was this combination. But the concern was about these long-acting beta agonists. And as you know, for years, there was a black box warning on all long-acting beta agonists because of concerns about uh, asthma death in patients prescribed these drugs. Until about a year now, that black box warning has been removed based on these thousands of patients, who tens of thousands of patients who are enrolled in randomized controlled trials where everybody received an inhaled steroid. And then some had added a long-acting beta agonist and some added a placebo. So um, no one was treating with long-acting beta agonists alone. They asked about risk of hospitalization, intubation, and death. And here, one of those uh, four studies comparing fluticasone with fluticasone plus salmeterol the long-acting beta agonist, there were no deaths in this study. There were two intubations and neither in the group uh, assigned to salmeterol, both in fluticasone alone. So there was no difference in serious adverse events. That was true for all of the studies and fewer uh, exacerbations. So the benefit from this combination um, uh, was clear and its safety demonstrated. Here are the choices. Uh, there are a number of generics now that have become available, fortunately, uh, for either salmeterol plus fluticasone. There's formoterol plus budesonide, formoterol plus mometasone, and now a once-daily combo, philanterol and fluticasone. Leukotriene modifiers, uh, we talked about effective, but not as effective as inhaled corticosteroids. And a black box warning has recently been added to Montelukas because of concerns about depression. Here's where the leukotrienes fit in biochemically. Either receptor antagonists where that xyluton blocks the five lipoxygenase enzyme that leads to generation uh, of the leukotrienes. And then... Uh, a novel uh, bronchodilator for asthma, widely used in COPD, teotropram, the long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Does it work in asthma? This was uh, tested in patients with poorly controlled asthma and beclomethasone. One group increased the dose of in, uh, inhaled steroids. The other added the long-acting beta-agonist salmeterol, and the other added teotropram. Would that work just as well? And it did. Doubling the dose of inhaled steroids wasn't a great strategy. Adding salmeterol here in terms of peak flow led to significant improvement, but so did teotropium, comparable. And what about patients already on combination inhaled steroid long-acting beta agonist? Adding teotropium to that setting led to improved lung function and decreased risk of exacerbation. So FDA has approved the use of teotropiums by Riva in patients with uh, asthma at a dose of 1.25 micrograms per pound. So this is perhaps a more modern step care approach where patients with uh, mild disease receive a short acting beta agonist as needed, or maybe that combination for motorol budesonide as needed stepping up to daily inhaled steroids, or maybe again, as needed, ICS lava. Then more severe disease, daily, twice daily, ICS lava at higher doses as needed. We can add a llama. And uh, here uh, we'll talk about the novel biologics. This diagram from an article by my colleague, Elliot Israel at the Brigham and Women's Hospital outlined all the different potential targets that have been discovered as we analyze the mechanisms of type 2 allergic inflammation on this side of the diagram, more neutrophilic or non-type 2 inflammation. 
And I show this only because here in yellow, all of these targets of cell-cell communicating uh, uh, chemicals and proteins uh, are targets of ongoing trials to interfere with the asthmatic pathway and improve treatment. And what has made it to market, we know already the anti-IgE monoclonal antibody omalizumab, they're the anti IL-5 monoclonal antibodies now that the IL-5 is a potent attractor of eosinophil. So that patient with refractory eosinophilic asthma that we mentioned, here's a, now an effective therapy um, that's not steroids. And finally, anti-IL-4 blocking the, the receptor for both IL-4 and IL-13. Again, uh, eosinophilic asthma. And the benefits have been fewer exacerbations, improved lung function, and the ability to lower the dose of steroids. Sorry about the slide formatting, but uh, uh, most of these drugs are given subcutaneously. Uh, some are every two weeks, some are every four weeks. Uh, one can be given every eight weeks after initial phase. Um, home administration is possible now with auto injectors, except for omalizumab. And there's a, generally a small risk of side effects, particularly to this concern of delayed uh, hyper uh, anaphylactic type uh, reaction to omalizumab. So patients carry an auto injector of epinephrine. Bronchial thermoplasty will just jump over quickly as an alternative for very severe refractory asthma. The idea of putting in a catheter, a little heat to burn the smooth muscle and interfere with contraction of the smooth muscle. Um, I think still probably experimental, uh, even though FDA approved, used in only limited settings. It's three bronchoscopies over a period of weeks. And although there was improved benefit in the subsequent year, there are significant complications associated with these bronchoscopies. Finally, selected special aspects I thought we could highlight. Aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. Maybe three to 5% of your patients will have a horrible asthma attack triggered by aspirin or any inhibitor of cyclooxygenase one. So ibuprofen, naproxen, et cetera. It's an acquired characteristic. The biochemistry is still being worked out associated with nasal polyposis, asthma, aspirin intolerance, and nasal polyposis, Samter's triad. And some patients who need aspirin can be desensitized with an oral desensitization procedure. People have, you've heard have exercise-induced asthma, meaning that they've identified exercise as the predominant trigger to their symptoms. But I would point out that exercise-induced bronchoconstriction is rather universal in asthma. If you exercise intensively enough for about five minutes, you'll induce post-exercise bronchoconstriction. It's different than dyspnea on exertion, climbing a flight of stairs. It's exercise followed by two to three minutes later, bronchoconstriction. The lower the air temperature, the higher the minute ventilation, cross-country skiing as an example, the more potent the stimulus to this bronchoconstriction. Patients can be treated with a beta agonist uh, before exercise. Montelukas, that leukotriene modifier, is also effective in blocking exercise bronchoconstriction. Another topic for a full lecture would be asthma in pregnancy. It is true that poorly controlled asthma is associated with worse outcomes in terms of fetal outcomes, but also for the mother. And uh, poor asthma control is associated with hypoxemia and uh, hypocapnia and vasoconstriction. So adverse outcomes make sense. The goal is good control of uh, asthma. Now, dyspnea of pregnancy is common. How do you sort that out versus asthma? We measure lung function. The point I wanted to make is that peak flow and FEV1 do not change significantly during pregnancy. So that's helpful. A low FEV1 or peak flow during pregnancy is due to asthma, not just uh, a big uh, uterus. And then uh, among the inhaled steroids, uh, budesonide has the most experience in, uh, in terms of registries of pregnant women and is uh, considered the safest. 
in terms of uh, adverse effects for fetal outcomes. Probably all of the inhaled steroids are relatively safe. Uh, 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 asthma plus syndromes uh, are worth mentioning. And that's patients with asthma who go on to de develop one, a sensitivity to aspergillus on their airways, a huge immune response to the aspergillus causing very high IgE levels, eosinophils, sometimes eosinophilic pneumonia or bronchiectasis, asthma with vasculitis, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, EGPA, or we used to call it Churg strauss syndrome, uh, worth noting, difficult multi-system because it's a vasculitis eosinophilic inflammation. And then there is great interest in asthma and cigarette smokers. You know, asthma doesn't prevent long-term cigarette smoking and patients can have some features of asthma and features of COPD. And the focus of the treatment should probably be on asthma. And last, uh, talking about asthma exacerbations, they say the best treatment of asthma, status asthmatic as a severe exacerbation, is to begin treatment three days before it occurs, which uh, highlights the fact that it's often a gradual decline from normal to mild, moderate, severe, et cetera, and there's opportunity to intervene. Uh, we treat these... Uh, uh, exacerbations with beta agonists, either by meter dose inhaler and nebulizer given frequently, systemic steroids, oral and intravenous given at uh, uh, comparable doses have the uh, equal effect, so it can be given orally. And then once the attack is better, especially as they leave the emergency room or your office, make sure they have a course of uh, systemic steroids and begin their inhaled corticosteroids in order to reduce recurrences. Let's take uh, this one question and see if we have unanimity on the answer. A 32-year-old woman presents with cough and wheeze of three months duration. Which of the following tests would confirm the diagnosis of asthma? Blood eosinophils uh, elevated, elevated IgE level, two or more positive allergen skin tests, or a 24-hour Holter monitor. Where did that come from? Hmm. Well, we have uh, certainly a strong majority uh, feeling that none of the above. I and I, I would uh, totally agree. You know. Um, Blood eosinophilia, high IgE level, these are markers perhaps of allergic inflammation. But could you have cough and wheeze and allergy from your seasonal rhinitis and cough and wheeze through aspirated foreign body or the like? It's possible. These are suggestive features, but none is diagnostic. How do you make a diagnosis, measure airflow obstruction, uh, and, and document reversible airflow obstruction, as you know. Good, I'd like to save our questions for the end of the day and proceed.